今天是三月十六号，来到啊阳、呃、明山新闻大学新闻及传播研究学院的新闻所，跟国际学生做演讲。先进来，演讲的场地。And uh, uh, the business of uh, RTI uh, has uh, radio stations for various languages, including uh, uh, Mandarin, Taiwanese, Hakka, and uh, Cantonese. Cantonese. And uh, they receive lots of international news and translate it into these uh, different languages. And uh, so uh, Shirley has been uh, working there for seven years and mainly doing the translation work and also we do host uh, programs oh, yes. as well. Yes, and uh, host programs as well. And uh, um, I just talked to uh, Shelley briefly that um, her um, her experience is very interesting because her uh, her major undergraduate major is mathematics and economics, which is totally irrelevant to uh, communication or <coughs> communications. And so she will explain to us uh, her um, her career, the whole the whole career um, route and uh, what's in her might and uh, Shirley has a very um, impressive uh, academic uh, um, achievement and she graduated from Wesley which is a very tough university in the States and uh, she has been uh, she has grown up uh, in Hong Kong in Japan, Japan and in the States Boston, yes. in, in the States as well so she lives three different places and do you speak Japanese as well uh, it's rusty <laughs> a little bit. So I think I'll pass the stage to Shelley and uh, let her to talk to us. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for inviting me, Professor Chen. And um, I'm really honored to be here today. So uh, first of all, I want to start off um, talking about myself, about my life. And maybe, um, you know, first of all, uh, if you guys read the Chinese title, um, it's like Yong Zi Shen. I'm a Chinese is not good, okay? But Yong Zi Shen, so, and, and Huo Jian Er Chu. Am I saying it right? Okay. But uh, which means, like, you know, from a pupa turning into a beautiful butterfly. And that really is my life. I'll explain that all to you later. But I'll show you um, a video first, okay, that I put together. It's about five or six minutes long. But uh, because right now I host a program called People at RTI, I'm with the English service, okay? Um, besides the Chinese, oh, sorry, I thought I'm loud enough. Am I not loud enough? No, it's a, no, okay, you want me to use this? Uh, all right, fine. Okay, um, so the thing is that um, we not only broadcast in Chinese languages, the four that Professor Chen just mentioned, but a total of 13 languages. We used to have 17, and we're down to 13 now. So there's English, there's um, uh, Japanese, Spanish, German, French, then uh, I already said Spanish, Russian, then Vietnamese, Tha um, Thai, and Indonesian, and then four Chinese dialects. So that's a total of 13 languages. And I'm with the English service. Okay, and I host a program called People. And the thing is that we are a radio station, we are a shortwave radio station. You know what that means? Shortwave, Duan Po, okay? So you need a special radio to listen to our programs. But 
you cannot hear any of our programs in Taiwan unless you go on the internet because we only broadcast abroad to the rest of the world. Okay, we have nine transmission stations all around the island, all right, and we transmit abroad. So, we introduce programs that have to do with introducing Taiwan to the rest of the world. So, that's what we do, and I'm with the English service. Anyway, I want to show you um, some of the interviews I've done in the Seing Pong. We have a film studio. Okay, which was set up in 2008, 2009. And so I have brought some of my interviews into the Seing Pong, you know, it's a film studio. And uh, I discovered I enjoy it very much. But uh, let's have to look at that video first, okay? <laughs> but the thing is, um, you know, spending all that time studying and working so hard and not having fun. I didn't fun. study, I had a lot of fun. Oh, well, see, you, you, okay, I'm just talking to someone who's just unusual probably, unique, you know, an exception, because I think... Um, My grades were horrible in the first and second year in high school, first, second, and third year in college. My grades were horrible because I was doing all sorts of other things. Oh, okay. Yeah. In high school, um, actually, a lot of my fellow schoolmates ha may remember, in high school, every summer, every winter, I was always out there in the mountains, in the seashore, in somewhere in Taiwan. During school years, I was singing, dancing, teaching people how to dance, doing all sorts of crazy things I never studied. Oh, well, this I didn't know about <laughs> you. Well, that's good to know. Well, okay. You, you can, actually, you can choose. You can have both worlds. You can walk and chew gum at the same time. <laughs> Except that you know how this cram school, you know, culture is in Taiwan. And I never went to any cram school. Oh, see? And see, that's the important part. Yeah, we should be telling the parents, right? Right. <laughs> don't I, I send your kids to him. You, you don't need to occupy every single moment of your child's life. I if know, you do that, you deprive that person of their own exploration of the world. Mm. Okay, so, well, there's one thing about you, uh, your personality being very outgoing and willing to take on different things and Crazy, learning and challenging. everything. And on the other hand, you've got supportive parents who doesn't tell you like study, study, study and no My parents fun. didn't know my grades were horrible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to this day? My father probably didn't even know my grades were horrible. Yeah. You know, I didn't give him my report cards. Yeah. <laughs> How did you manage to do that? Oh, I took it from the envelope. I took it from our mailbox and signed the name myself. Seriously? Seriously? Wow. <laughs> We're revealing all kinds of secrets about Joanna today. So. Right. Oh. Well, so do you think that you're closer to your father? I'm very close to my father. Yeah, than your mother? I'm extremely close to my father. I gradually learned to be close to my mother. It really has to be, it has to be up and down. And I think that... Um, I've interviewed, and I, and I hopefully I can share with them my experience as an employer. Yeah. And I've interviewed a lot of people who have beautiful resumes, beautiful resumes. But when you interview them, you say, wow, where's the experience? Not uh -huh. only the experience from a job perspective, but where's the life experience? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, I like to see that. I like to see people who've worked very different jobs and worked um, at a very young age because they've taken that responsibility at a young age. Mm. I think a lot of the kids not just in Taiwan, but the kids nowadays have been very sheltered. Mm, and yeah. all they have to do is get good grades. I but know. that's not all about life. Right. And I, and I tell you, I look at resumes, and I don't think I've ever looked at the grade point average. Because <laughs> to me, that's not important. I know what you mean. What is important is what kind of experience do you have? What have you done? Right. And what will let, you, will let me know something about you? Mm. And what will let me know that you are going to be a value and an asset to my organization? And all I right. think that's key. All right. Thank you so much, Richard. Well, you thank know, you for having me. You inspire me with that positiveness <laughs> about you know thank life you. and perspective of life. But um, I hope you keep on sharing that with young people. They really need to hear this. Well, yeah. I appreciate that. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to okay. uh, engage in you and also into the audience. And uh, I'd like to do it again soon. All right, great. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for watching, people. I'm Shirley Lin. Welcome back to People, I'm Shirley Lin. Today my guest is Fanny Xu, who is the Director of Cortronic Culture and Arts Foundation. Now earlier on we were talking about uh, just how she spent 18 years abroad and uh, she, that you were into galleries, mm -hmm. art galleries and um, auctions. You know, I have a question for you though, I'm just really <laughs> curious. Was there ever any time at a formal auction mm -hmm. that someone yelled out and said, this is fake? 
Mm, not on the auction day, <laughs> I hope not. I meant on uh -huh. the auction day. But yeah, no? but I think it, if it's, never it's a happened right auction, no, yeah. never. <laughs> but if it's a right auction, we always op um, open for discussion. Cause yeah. Profession. Uh, someone asked me what's an expert. I think expert is someone who's made all the mistakes they can make. Then you become <laughs> an expert on that is things. True. So I think it's it's okay to be open and to uh, have opinions, mm -hmm. uh, to welcome different opinions, but you come down to a conclusion. But even the world famous experts can cannot agree on one. Uh, famous mm. painting or another, but you do the best you can and uh -huh. there's different ways, you know, like what I mentioned before, the training of your eyes and yeah. the careful research and scholarly uh, research that can help you to the um, conclusion, yeah. I hope. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Never well, on the day, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, what role do you play when you go to these camps? Um, you gave a speech, you do classes, No. you play with them? I have all the best people. I find the best people do that. Oh. All my but job you, is to say too. thank you to everybody. Oh, I see. <laughs> and, and yeah, I have, of course, a strong administration team. Yes, I have yes. to back them up. Yeah, all right. Sure. Thank you so much, You're Mr. Yen. I've learned so much from you. Yeah. I really appreciate your big heart. And oh. um, I hope that you can... I'm sure you'll be still continue to contribute a lot more to, you know, to Taiwan. I believe everybody, if you really be able to uh, encourage them, everybody do have a big heart. <sighs> it just sometimes you have to uh, try to understand that is going to be your priority for your life. All yeah. right. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching, people. I'm Shirley Lin. Well, um, so those were just excerpts of some of the interviews I've done in the film studio at our radio station. Uh, let me just tell you the rundown for today. I'll talk for about 35 minutes or so, and then we can have a Q&A, and then we'll have a break, and then after that I'll go for the second half, and then another, to end off, you know, I have another Q&A at the end, okay, just to let you guys know. All right. Well, um, let me start off with talking about my life, because um, to get to this point, you know, with the interviews, um, uh, my life has gone through a lot. Um, I, first of all, I was born in Taiwan. I am from Taiwan. And like uh, Professor Chen said, I've lived in Hong Kong. Uh, that's where I spent my elementary school years. And then uh, Tokyo, where I spent my junior high and high school years. And then I went to Wellesley College uh, in Boston. Um, and so, then, after that, I've been back for quite a long time. Um, I went to um, international school in, actually I went to a convent school that's more like, you know, um, run by nuns, Do you know what I mean? <laughs> okay. And then I went to, in Tokyo, I went to an international school. So everybody that graduated from international school would automatically want to go abroad for college and so I did likewise. But um, I grew up not as someone with a lot of confidence because um, this has to do with my father. You know, I'm sure that either your parents, either your father or your mother is the more controlling character. Well, in my life, it's my father. And so he basically decided which college I should go to. And then when I got there, what major I should major in. That's why economics. I later added math because I've always liked math. And in fact, when I was younger, um, my father actually got us a tutor, you know, a one-on-one -on -one tutor. And so I got really good at calculating math, all right? And so I thought, well, why don't I add a math major and make it a double major? Because it's very common to major, double major in the States. So I thought, it looks impressive, right, to double major. So I added a math. Little did I know that Math in college is all theory. I don't know if you guys like theory, but I hate theory. So, but anyway, I managed to graduate, okay, in economics and math. Then um, I worked, actually in my field, kind of, economics, with um, these like commodities firm. Uh, the first job was a commodities firm, a futures commodities firm. You know, you sell things like sell wheat, you know, or, or well, not gold. But anyway, wheat or rice or 
you know, crops and things like that. Okay, futures, commodities. Then I worked at an investment management company before I came back to Taiwan. And after I came back to Taiwan, I was working for an investment consulting firm. And then, then I went home and became a full-time mother. But after that, I got an opportunity to work at MCA Records. It's a record company. And it's, you know, in Taiwan, it's become universal now. But anyway, so I worked there uh, under Wang Weizhong, uh, who is a famous uh, TV producer here in Taiwan. Uh, you know, I worked under him as a secretary for a year. And actually, he doesn't, he's not into, his field is not music. And neither was I. So, but anyway, uh, it was an experience. I mean, if you guys know what kind of person he is, you know, he likes scolding you. He's always picking on you. He makes you feel like he's the tiger, you know. But actually, I'm, I was born in the year of the tiger. But anyway, so, um, but, you know, I was like, because I we used to work at secretary at, in the States. And when I came back to Taiwan, I thought, Oh, secretary, that's a piece of cake, right? And I've always worked as an office lady, so I thought it's a piece of cake. But I realized that the culture is very different. In the States, if you're asked to do A, B, and C, you just get A, B, and C done, and then you go home. You know, you get off work at five. But here, I realized that if your boss asks you to do A, B, C, you're supposed to think what's D, F, D, E, F, G. So I learned the hard way. Because I remember the first job I had in Taiwan, the boss was very unhappy with me. He was very displeased with my performance. And I said that, you know, actually, by the way, this is my husband, John. <laughs> you know, I told him, I said, I'm going to quit. And I said three times before I finally, he said that you should talk to him. I said, oh, I can't talk to him. But the next morning I woke up and I said, that's true. I've never, you know, ex I've never com communicated with him about my feelings about work. So I talked to him and then I realized that he was just feeling a lot of pressure. He was just putting it on me, but actually I'm not, I, I don't have any faults, okay? He's just kind of using me as a punching you know, bag or something like that. So, okay, so that worked out fine, I kept working. But uh, you know, actually people were very envious. Why is it that I have such a good relationship with my boss? It's almost like good friends, not boss to secretary, you know? But anyway, so that was a great working experience with that boss. And after I quit, I kept in touch with him and everything. Then after CM, uh, MC, oh wait, no, that was the first job. All right, and then MCA Records, after a year, I again went home and became a full-time mother. Then afterwards, I went back to Tower News. Uh, that was another job. I was there for a year because they wanted to try um, setting up some English classes, courses for adults. And so I kind of got in there and we tried, I tried at it for a year. Then I quit because it was just too hard. <laughs> so I didn't make much profit. But anyway, it was a good experience. So then after that, I went home again and became a full-time mother. This, this time for quite a long time, many years, before... Um, I realized that there was this job opportunity at RTI, Zhongyang Guangbo Dian Tai. I went and actually I interviewed for the job twice, but in a in a span of five, uh, sorry in a span of eight years. Yeah, in a span of eight years, because the first time I went in, you have to take a, a written test. I took the written test. They test you on translation, like Professor Chen was saying, but. That was to prepare us for hosting your own program in English, translating the news from Chinese into English, and also being a reporter on your own. You think about your programs yourself, you think of the topic yourself, then you contact people yourself, then you go out and do interviews yourself, and you come back, then you get all your information together, and you write your own script, and then you record your own program, and you edit it everything by yourself. Just one person. Not like NPR. Do you guys know their radio station? You know, for every three minute program, there's a team of 15 people behind it to, to make the final product. Can you imagine? But me, it's one person, 
doing a 15 minute program. <laughs> but anyway, so, but it's good. I like working at RTI because they also teach you, you know, uh, how to control the machine. You don't just talk into the microphone, not like this, but you have to also do the machine while you do the program. Or even when I do live news broadcast at 7 p.m. every day, we have to control the machine ourselves while we do live news broadcast. So that's pretty much where, you know, from, from my childhood to now is how I got here. But the thing is, it all looks glamorous, right? You know, all this thing, but actually there's a lot to my life um, to get to where I am at this point because I'm a person who doesn't have a lot of confidence in myself, didn't used to. But today, I think, I think, you know, I think God has really blessed me. So, but let's have watched the video here. Uh, not a video. Uh, I've got a slideshow. And how I went from pupa to a butterfly. And this is, um, this was me in about high school, I'd say. And this is me actually in the sewing home, in the film studio. But, um, yeah, did I look very confident here? I don't think so. <laughs> so. I was definitely a, a lot fatter then. <laughs> um, you know, in the States, you actually would gain a lot of weight because there's so much food fattening. This is my family. That's John and um, my older daughter, Cynthia, and my second daughter, Clarita, and Charles, my, th my son, who's now 15, um, 16, and 18. So I'm not as young as you think I am. <laughs> All right. Oh, we try to have fun. And I'm very thankful for my husband, who's a very outgoing person. Now, with a straight father that I have, you can imagine my life is very confined. I, um, I have to do things a certain way because my father is a very high demanding person. He has very high expectations of himself, which is not all bad, but that turns me into someone who's also very high demanding on myself. I'm very hard on myself. And so, likewise, I'm very hard on my husband. <laughs> you know, so that's how it rose into a problem, right? But, um, but you know, that's, that's how I used to be. Okay. Yeah, we try to have fun. And I think my kids and my husband has helped me to relax and enjoy life, you know, more than not. Um, this is, um, you know, a whole family. Um, this is my father. Oh, I can use this. That's my father. That's my mom. Those are my in-laws. We are a happy family together. Yes. This is actually on tour. And um, actually, you know, both families have a very good relationship. This is very rare for Taiwanese, um, you know, both sides, families get well, I mean, get along very well. But tour. You know, my dad is very generous, and um, every tour, which is the day when, uh, tour is the second day of the Chinese New Year, where the wives go back to her parents' place. Okay, well, we always eat out. It's been a tradition for many years, and my father would invite my in-laws to eat with us. Yes, so that's how great our relationship is. I went to Wellesley. It's a beautiful campus. And by the way, um, there have been stories, and I think my dad kind of falls into that category, why he chose Wellesley, I think, is because the campus is so beautiful that I remember I have a Xue Mei, you know, someone who's an alum but younger than me, you know, a couple of years younger than me. She said that she went with her parents, they flew to Boston, and it was at night, so they went to bed. But the next morning, her parents got up really early, decided to go walk around the campus first, take a nice morning walk, and she was still sleeping in the hotel. Her parents came back and told her, you're going to Wellesley. Why? Because it's a beautiful campus, I don't care what you think, you're going to Wellesley. And a lot of people had decided, made the daughters go to Wellesley because of that. So that is how beautiful our campus is. This is uh, Lake Waben. Yeah, we have a lake. All right, um, for those of you who don't know Wellesley, um, yeah, I'm sure my dad, you know, 
he wants all the glamour for me. So uh, he picked Wellesley Campus, uh, Wellesley College. I actually was on wait list for Wellesley um, because I also applied to several other, you know, pretty good, because I did well in high school, you know, in Tokyo. And so I applied to like seven colleges in the States and I got into all of them, except Wellesley, I was put on wait list. And at the time, my dad would bring me to, um, to, uh, to send a telegram every week, every Monday, to Wellesley saying how much I want to go. So every week he would bring me to the telegram office and send a telegram to the college. Well, maybe that worked because I finally got in. Yeah. Uh, Wellesley, Madame Chiang Kai-shek, you guys know? Yes, wife of, um, you know, Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek. Um, so she was an alum of Wellesley College. She went to Wellesley College. So did Hillary Clinton. Okay. And Diane Sawyer, do you guys know her? She's an ABC anchor woman. Actually, she just went back to be an anchor woman this year, I believe, at the age of 60 or something like that. Amazing. They use older women, older, <laughs> mature, secure women in the States to do news. Not here where they use la me, right? <laughs> I don't know. The culture is so different. But there are pros and cons, you know. So there's definitely good and bad to this. But, you know, they, they, they must uh, be so successful to be able to sit back on the anchor table to be you know, the news broadcast. Do you guys know her? Lian Huixin, who is the daughter, the older daughter of Lian Zhan, who is now the honorary KMT chairman, and who was also previously, you know, vice president and all that. So, okay, so that's her, uh, sorry, his daughter. Uh, she's our, my Mei at Wellesley. Okay, um, I just want to talk about some of the, uh, some of the interviews, you know, interesting interviews I've had uh, with people. Um, this one is uh, Phil Chernogovsky, who, um, he has a, a sad story to tell, how he became a fan of Zhou Dijiang, uh, Jiang Hui, who is like top, you know, uh, Taiwanese diva in the Taiwanese language, okay? So that's her. Um, Phil's story, I don't know if you guys know, but uh, many years ago, his, uh, his, sorry, his son, Ruben, came to Taiwan and climbed Adi Mountain, but then he got lost and nobody found his body. His father came to Taiwan six times to look for his body, to look for him, and he never found him. But he made a lot of friends uh, in Taiwan, a lot of indi indigenous people, a lot of uh, the policemen, a lot of people who helped as rescue workers. And, um, and one time when he was in the camp, he was feeling very sad and he listened that the cab driver was playing Jiang Hui's music in the camp. He really felt very comforting, even though he doesn't know one word of Chinese. And the driver, realized that he was enjoying the music. He said, this is Taiwan number one. He kept saying Taiwan number one, you know. And then took out the CD and gave it to him. So he brought it home. He just loved, you know, her music. She, he collected a total of like 10 of her albums. And every Sunday, because he sculpts, you know, he sculpts usually uh, human figures maybe the face and all that kind of stuff. He's very into sculpting, and he always does that every Sunday. And um, so what he did was that he would play Jiang Hui's music, and the music would give him inspiration, and then he would sculpt. So that's what he would do every Sunday. And Jiang Hui finally heard about him, so invited him to one of her concerts, all the way from New Zealand. By the way, yeah, Phil is from New Zealand, okay? And um, so she, he was like a special guest uh, at the concert, and uh, she sang a song dedicated to him. So I got in touch with him by email. He doesn't have a computer at his home, 
and he would always have to go into the city to you know use the cafe, um, the um, internet cafe to see my email. So I always have to write him an email. I have to wait and hope that he would see my email. And then so the first time we did a phone interview, but then when he came for the concert, I want to make sure he come in and have an interview with me. And that's how we met and had the interview. Yes, I had an interview with uh, Vincent Xiao, um, our former VP. And um, he is, you know, like they say, he smiles a lot. He's a really cute old man, you know. And um, he, I'll tell you the secret, but I'm sure he wouldn't mind. He um, actually had, had a script. So he was reading from the script. So I asked a question and you read the script. I asked another question. And you, so you know how it is with politicians. They don't let you have the freedom to ask them questions. They tell you, you can only ask me this, this, and this. Okay? And um, it was funny because um, he was reading the script, right? The prompt machine. And then I was like, you know, going like that. And, you know, he's reading and reading. You know, he reads slowly. And then all of a sudden he stopped. And I'm going like, wow! Because <laughs> I didn't know that he just read to the end of the script, you know? So then I go, I, was like, I didn't know how to, what, what to do. So my first you know, first thing, instinct was that, wow. <laughs> so then I went on to the next question, but it was fun. And he said that if you, re I said, can I go off the script and ask you one or two questions? He said, yes, but if you talk louder because he does have good hearing, then yes, he says, fine. Well, I did ask him a question, but he didn't catch it. So he went on to the next script, you know, and I was going, <laughs> but um, anyway, it was fun. It really was fun. Um, I don't know if you know, I even interviewed a cook, yes, <laughs> a chef. Um, he's executive chef of Mei Fu, Mei Fu um, Shiping. It's Mei Fu company in food and beverages. Um, they have, he has uh, a supermarket, um, a steakhouse, and a neuromian shop, okay, um, in Mei Hu. And I interviewed him because he has a story to tell. He really does. Um, he, he, um, he brought in dry-aged beef, gan sou, niu rou. He said, that's the way to eat beef. You know, I can tell you why. Because it's dried 21 days, not in a freezer, not in a fridge, just in a you know, temperature-controlled room for 21 days. It would get all ugly and dry on the outside. But then when you grill, cook this kind of steak, once it's brought in front of you and you cut into it, there will be no blood flowing out from the steak. Do you know what I mean? Let's say that you eat a steak that's like medium rare, san fen wu fen sou, okay? But you know how you cut into it and the blood comes out? Well, there's no blood with this kind of dry aged beef, gan sou, niu rou. So um, he brought this into Taiwan, this idea. So it's very interesting. He, his father said, you don't have a future, so I'm going to send you to Australia, and then you're going to learn English there. But what he did was that he went to Australia, he learned how to make pizza. Mm -hmm. Then he brought pizza back. He's from Kaohsiung. He, he opened up a pizza place. It was the most popular pizza place for a lot of people for um, uh, most foreigners until, until what, until Pizza Hut came in. Wow. Then he lost business, you know, he had to close his shop. So then he said, okay, I mean, he went back to, actually he went to Australia twice because he wants to make, he wanted to make perfect pizza, you know. But anyway, then he next he went to the States and, uh, and learned how to make steak. So then he learned how to make steak so he traveled abroad like four or five times. He's so into wanting to perfect everything. He really wants to, and his dream is to let everybody know that this is the best kind of steak that you can have. And um, Taiwanese people are catching on slowly but surely. So, this is our former GIO minister. Okay, uh, yeah, she went, she went to, right. And um, it's very interesting. He was our boss, our big boss for RTI. And so when I interviewed him, it was so funny. 
I researched about him, right? And I sent it to his uh, assistant. But I, when his assistant didn't say anything back to me, I thought that all the information I got from the internet was correct, 100% correct, I thought, because they didn't say that it's anything wrong. So at the interview, I said something like, oh, I know that you collect antique cars, and then you actually ship the car from the States back to Taiwan. I said, no, that's not true. I was like, oh, oh, sorry, you know. And then also I thought that in a, on the internet it says that he studied in Japan. He said, no, I didn't. I made like three mistakes. So what do you do? It's a formal interview. So what I did was that I actually, I actually apologized in the interview. I said, I'm sorry. But then because he's with um, the information, you know, the government and information office, I said, you guys should do something about this. <laughs> because if all the information about you that's out there on the internet, people think that it's true. But if it's not, you need to do something about this. Like, you know, there's always all this false information. That's why there's gossips. There's why, that's why there's, you know, fake one. That's why people's stories are distorted so much. You know, totally upside down. But I said, you should do this. <laughs> you should do something about this. But anyway, I try to kind of you know, smooth over the rough parts in the interview. And that takes, um, that takes a quick mind, you know, and, and then kind of, you know, thinking, try to, uh, I don't know, uh, correct the wrongs, you know, yeah, so, to right the wrongs. Um, I don't know if you guys have been to the International Flora Expo. International Flora Expo, um, Huabo, right? You know how on Zhongshan Bei, Beilu, on the Zhongshan North Road, there is a building that's made out of 1.5 million PET plastic bottles. You guys know that building, right? Well, he designed it. So, um, his company designed it. And um, so he's really into, you know, eco-friendly products and everything. He also made um, these uh, covers for iPhone 5. I don't know if you guys have iPhone 5. Uh, no? No? Oh, otherwise I can give you one of these, uh, you know, plastic covers. Uh, but I mean, um, smartphone covers for you. But anyway, so um, he's a young guy, very smart. He figured that, you know, um, basically, he's very humble. He said that I'm just putting what everybody talks about into action. Because he says people talk about, oh, we should do this, we should make this so that we can love the earth. But he says, I just make what everybody says and make it happen. So, he's a pretty smart but humble guy. Okay, Nick Vasilovich. Okay, he's um, from Zurich, Switzerland. And uh, he's director of Pilot Fish, which is a design, industrial design company in Neihu. Um, sometimes you don't know what kind of interviewee you're going to get. Just what kind of personality he has. Well. You know how, what's NG? Well, he NG many times during the interview. <laughs> he kept saying like, can I do that over again? Oh, I don't like that. Can I say that again? You know, and it's like, what do you do? But uh, yeah, he was that kind of person. I guess he's a perfectionist, uh, worse than I am. <laughs> but but uh, he really cared a lot. But he's a very, very, like almost too polite kind of person. But um, that's Nick. Arvin Chen, do you guys know the movie called Ye Taipei? Um, Au revoir Taipei. Well, he made that film. And it actually won a um, Berlin Bear Festival of War Film Award um, and a couple of others. So I interviewed him in the Sein Pong. And um, you know, something about movie directors, they're usually very shy. And, and I'm really glad that he decided because I'm actually going to be interviewing somebody um, another movie director next week, but he insists on not going on camera, okay? But he was willing. Um, at the end of the interview, he really encouraged me by saying that I asked really good questions. And he was like probably one of the first interviews that I did in the Sun Pong. So I was really encouraged and um, uh, we still in touch sometimes, yes. Shalene, um, Shalene Shi, she's the producer at Dynamic Communications, but he also, she um, made uh, 
a documentary called Trash to Treasure. It's called Lu Se Bao Zhang, which got nominated for a golden Jingzhong Golden Bell last year. Yeah. Uh, for Best Director's Award, I think. And uh, um, she's interesting. She made some really um, interesting uh, films herself. And um, like her father has suffers from depression. She actually made uh, a documentary about it. She's very open about her life. And, um, and it actually won an award. Um, she called it Blue Papa or something like that, or Papa Blue, sorry, Papa Blue, yeah. And uh, so it's amazing. And you know, it's very interesting. Um, when you get to know people, then you realize that, oh, she did a documentary with, um, you know, Trash to Treasure. She knew Arthur Huang, the one who, you know, designed the Eco Arc, the 1.5 PD bottle building for Flora Expo. So uh, Arthur Huang's that, um, his documentary was in this, I mean, you know, this whole documentary uh, that he made, that she made, uh, for, that got nominated. So, um, yeah. <coughs> I don't know if you guys know her, know him, Isaac Ho, Hu Zhi, Hu Hu Qi Zhi, okay, he's a street artist. He, um, he actually, his great, most from most familiar kind of performance is on a seer wheel. It's about as big and as tall as himself, okay? And he turns around on the wheel, you know? And also he plays with a crystal ball and kind of rolls the crystal ball, you know, around his shoulder and back and arm and everything. Yeah, so he's a very interesting guy. And after the interview, we talked even more we talked about his life, we talked about his marriage, we talked about his wife, and that's the part I like. It's not so much in front of camera, it's that I have a curiosity about people, you know? And so the curiosity gives you a good interview. And so even afterwards, I still enjoy his life, I want to know more about him. So I chat before the interview, I even chat afterwards. That is if they have time for me. Yeah, and he was one of them. Uh, Shi Yingying, she's an independent singer, and uh, she's into um, more contemporary gospel music. Um, she's a very friendly, personable person, and it was the first interview I did in the Sun Yipong where she sang. And you know, this has to do with like, oh, if you get a good microphone and how far, and because singers a very a perfectionist. They wanted to sound right. So she kind of did her song. Uh, she just did a cappella, so without music, uh, because of copyright. But anyway, no, actually not because of copyright. But anyway, she decided to sing a cappella. She actually redid it like three times. So until it's like she thinks perfect. Then we went for the interview, the talk part. But, um, but she's very personable, you know, very friendly and um, has a lot of ambition and great dreams for her own life. So that was really, that was really a good interview too. Liu, um, um, sorry, Lin Xiuwei. Um, she is a, a dancer from way back, I think more like our generation probably, you know, and uh, she uh, is producer of Contemporary Legend Theater and they perform these great you know, like they turned Macbeth, you know, all these Greek plays in, into a Chinese style kind of opera. So she's amazing, you know, and they also did like King Lear, you know, Macbeth and all those. So this uh, is her husband and um, she is a tiny, tiny woman. You know, she drove up to the radio station and when she got out, it was like, I was surprised she's just a tiny woman, but um, she is, she is amazing. She never learned English properly, but because she would go abroad, bring her troupe, and perform abroad, that's how she practiced her English. And that's how she learned it. And she's very brave. She's not afraid. She's not shy. She, doesn't, she wasn't afraid of making mistakes. Her English was not perfect, but 
we had a great interview in the in the in the studio. And when when she decided to leave, when she was ready to leave, she gave me a hug, and that meant everything to me. Yeah, about a friendship or how the interview went. Uh, this is a good friend of ours, uh, husband and wife. Um, in fact, they were very successful. She was like. I believe she was Bainu and then Tai Da, right? And he was uh, a psychiatrist, very successful. But then um, in 2007, I believe, they went to, they moved to Beijing. Uh, they wanted to kind of continue the dream there. But in a ski accident, he became paralyzed from like chest down and is in a wheelchair. Um, but they have a very brave, amazing story to tell uh, because at the time, you know, China, um, some, sometimes things are, are more like backwards. So when they were at the ski, when the accident happened, everybody there just froze, didn't know what to do. So he, fortunately, he's a doctor. So he says, you guys call the ambulance, you guys should pick me up this way and not that way and now that. And um, it's amazing. But he's a fighter. And now he is the CEO of Spinal Cord Injury Foundation, so they can help people just like him. Uh, he's very positive, very thankful. He's, he's not like, yeah, he did begin with saying, like, why me? But afterwards, he changed to asking, what do I need to do now? And that's a, a great young couple. They don't have any children yet, so maybe they will think about adopting eventually, but I don't know, yeah. So that was a great story. Okay, there's Danny Yen, which you've just seen just the um, interview earlier. Um, this is uh, John and Gerard He, He Yolong, of um, Dale Carnegie Training. Um, I just appreciate one thing after the interview. Um, I asked them, every single guest that would come you know, for my on my show, to sign a guest book afterwards. And what Gerard, the son, oh sorry, what Gerard, the son, said, um, wrote, was saying like, it felt like talking to an old friend, you know, and um, that really meant a lot to me. Like, he liked the interview, he felt like it was a chat, not like a serious kind of, you know, very tense kind of interview, so. And that's how I go about with my interviews, actually. There's uh, Joanne Lei, Joanna Lei, sorry, and then Richard Chang, he's tall. 190 centimeters. But, uh, you know, interesting thing about him, like I think he said earlier in the interview you saw, is that he uses all athletes uh, work at Costco. So they're all tall like him. And why? Because he says that he knows that even though these people that he worked with, he got into the company, were former basketball players or, I don't know, swimmers or whatever, but he knows that they're disciplined that they can, you know, work hard at their job. They can persevere at their job, you know. And I really like that about him. I think he said earlier, if you caught it, he said, when I interview people, I don't look at their GPA. Some of them, I don't even look at the GPA at all, you know, the grade average. He doesn't look at academic grades. He looks at what can you contribute to the company to see you as a person, you know, what have you done? You know, that's more important. And I hope that, that you guys, Yes, yeah, study is important, but more so is, are you happy with what you're doing? I want you to think about pursuing dreams that you know that you can be happy and also contribute to society. So every one of you are born with certain talents. It's a matter of where and when you're going to discover that talent that's hidden in you, because that's what happened to me. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you about that later, second half. Okay. Oh. Leonard Zhao, um, he's the former ambassador to Swaziland. And um, when at the interview, at the very end, he said that when he and his wife were leaving Swaziland to come back to Taiwan, they were on a plane and the pilot made an announcement on, you know, over the intercom and said, we have Ambassador Zhao and his wife on a plane with us. We really thank them for the contribution to the country because he brought electricity to Swaziland, literally. Because they did, had no electricity before, he brought electricity to the country. So 
you know, he, they made this announcement. They said, we thank them all these years for the contribution, what they've done for the country. So let's give them applause. His wife broke down and cried. And right there and then, when he was telling the story, I felt like crying. I said, oh, I really did. So I, I, I really get into the interview, I guess. You know, if you listen to their stories, they have amazing stories to tell. And I think that's what I like about interviewing people. That's Fanny, um, Fanny Xu, who is Director of Quartronic Culture and Arts Foundation. Uh, they have a Jijinghui, a foundation. So it's into light, you know, all the different kinds of lights and everything. But uh, I asked her, I said, light, how's that different from art? You know, so he said, well, that's a good question. But anyway, you can certainly go on and watch my interviews, you know, at other time. Aaron Berg, um, he brought his bicycle into the studio. So we tried to, because he's really into biking, he had cancer uh, of the lymph, I think, and, um, but he survived. And he became a triathlete, Tian uh, Sanxia, right? So he's really into biking, he's very thin, but he's very healthy. Very positive thinker, just like Joshua Xu, the one who was in wheelchair. And uh, he brought his bike in there. So you think like, well, I want him to bring a bike, but I didn't know what to do with it. But I, you know, it's a good thing that I work with my crew and figure it out of some ways. He actually relates life to wheel. He said if the wheel's not proper, then your life would be a wreck. But you know, how the wheel needs to flow. So you have to check your bike before you go biking and things like that. So he relates to things, you know. All right. And I just want to say that Larry King is my idol. But it's afterwards that I realized he's my idol because I read his book. One thing he said, and I always remember this because I think that's me, is he said that during the interview, you should think, you should listen carefully to the person telling his story because if you listen carefully, it will definitely lead you to the next question that you're going to ask him. And I realized that that's what I do. I listen carefully to the, to the stories. You know, some people, they prepare themselves with 10 questions and they go ask, you know, boom, answer, okay, boom, answer, boom, answer. No, I, I prefer and I, I think it's, it's better to the listener and to the viewer is that you listen intently and then you ask a question relating to what he just said. Then it flows, and I think it's definitely more pleasant to listeners and to the audience if you have that kind of interview. So, um, yeah, I just want to say that he's my um, idol. TV, I'm not the one controlling the machine. So, I mean, obviously the TV guy, you know, my producer or director, he said that you can stop anytime, but it's a pain for him to stop and then start over, and it's a pain for me too. So. You know, it's, um, I wouldn't say any bad because after all they're not live. Wait until I do live programs, then I'm going to tell you what was a bad one, you know. Because I don't think I even know um, if I can do live right now. Yeah. I'm just thinking about the feelings, because when I did interview by myself, it's sometimes that you're, you're thinking that it was, it will be good, but after afterwards you're feeling so bad because you thought that it would be so wonderful, so nice, and this person would be this and that, but actually it's totally opposite. And you feel, well, I, I felt totally down and depressed. Right. That's a very good question. Because, like, on my way up here, I was telling John, sometimes you never know what kind of person your interviewee is. You know, he accepted the interview and said, great, oh great, I got an interview. But if he's a he or she is a difficult person to deal with, yeah, it can be nerve-wracking. I can understand. What's a bad interview is, you know, um, when I do only broadcast interviews, I keep to like, maybe like 16, 18, to 18 minutes because eventually I have to cut it down to 15. And when at the end of the interview, I feel like I haven't gotten to the meat of the interview then I feel bad. And that has happened a lot of times. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that was bad preparation on my part or what, but I know 
I, I talk a lot. Well, I don't talk a lot. I ask a lot of questions. And maybe the, the person talks a lot too. And, you know, sometimes it takes a long time before you finally get into, you know, the, the role of things in the interview, but time's up. Yeah, I, yes, you're right. I have some of the interviews like that, but not in the, not in the film studio, but yes, only for broadcast, yes. Uh, did you ask, like, what, what, what did I do with those? Mm -hmm. Okay, sometimes for a 15-minute program, I let the interview go for maybe like 16, 17, 18, 19, but there were times when I was like interviewing and I wasn't getting it. I didn't feel that it was good enough to end. So I let it go for like 20, 25 before finally I cut it. But that means doing more work afterwards, right? Trying to edit down 15. That's how I, I, I deal with it. But there were times when I just kind of just let it go because Maybe the interview wasn't a talker, and so I, you feel like no matter what you do, it's just not going to be any better. So yeah, there are times, and I know I don't know about you, you know what kind of personality you are, but I'm a person very hard on myself. I feel like ah, oh, you know, if only I had done this, if only I had done that. But I know, yeah, that's normal. So we're in the same boat. <laughs> Good question. Thanks. Any other questions? How about we take a 10 minute break? Is that okay? Yes. Yeah, sure. Okay, a 10 minute break. I'm sure those Aboriginal children, uh, their parents are very grateful to you. Um, I think in the book you also mentioned the important role that parents should play in the children's future. Do you want to talk about that? Because I'm a parent myself. Okay. What do you have to say? To parents because they do play a big role. As I think education, especially in Asia, we're very behind. Mm -hmm. We still believe examination is the only way to judge people's, uh, stu young people's mm -hmm. talent. We do not understand every young people have different talent and potential. That is so true. And you have to, as a parent or as a school teacher, they, their first job is not to, uh, to, uh, to examine the, the young people, it's trying to find the talent each individual is different. Yeah, and, everybody's and different. I think, I think Yetz, uh, from a long time, Yetz have made a comment. He said, education is not pulling water into bucket, uh -huh. it is lighting a fire. Okay. But unfortunately, after so many years, we are still pulling water into buckets. Uh -huh. In Taiwan, we call Tian Ya Si Jiao Xue. Yes. We force feeding knowledge to their knowledge. Force feeding. To, mm -hmm. to their brand. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, when you force feeding them, force them to memorize some of the things, they can easily today pick up an iPad, mm -hmm. an iPhone, they can get all the answers, they can Google and getting all the answers they want. And we force the kids to m use their brand, okay, mistakenly, just force them to feeding a lot of knowledge. And uh, so as a teacher, I think today, what we really need is your job is not to teach your pe young people, mm -hmm. you are working with them to help them to discover problems, Their finding talent. solutions. Uh -huh. Okay, and even more important is, as a teacher, they always have to the, have the confidence to make the young people better than themselves, better mm -hmm. than teacher themselves, mm. rather than trying to only teach them and uh, give them no alternative to think other possibilities. Mm. Yeah. Wow. What is your future plan? I'm sure you've got a lot of ideas right here. You know, plans, dreams about what you can do for the children. Maybe not only the children of Taiwan, but the, you know, the whole community of Taiwan. What, what is your, your dream? I mean, you're always so mission-oriented. I, you know, as your time goes older, you know your time is limited. What yes. you can do is also limited. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, in one way, on a national-wide basis or worldwide basis, I'm trying to write my book. Okay, okay. In the Chinese community, the book is selling not only in Taiwan, also in China, in Hong Kong, other places. So I'm trying to tell young uh, Asian parents they should have different approach to their kids' futures. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other thing is I'm, I'm fo concentrating myself at the East Coast. I believe instead of trying to do a little bit of everything everywhere, I should focus myself and trying to... In one area. Trying to, in, uh, to 
to really hard, uh, try hard, learn hard, and finally you can you can demonstrate something that it, that it, that can work. Right. You you need some adjustments. You you need to make some some effort. But at the end, I hope that can be something can for other destination can follow oh, so okay. for the government can be considered yeah but it seems that you're trying to focus mostly on the art or the music area art, first culture, their talent yeah and uh, I'm trying to for example I'm seriously thinking about building a vocational school with bilingual vocational school good good because when you have a bilingual vocational school you let the young people really connect the world Oh, which in that Taiwan, is so true. Yeah, you never have a vocational school have yeah. bilingual. Oh, all right. You know, uh, decisions or my own likes. I'm not even sure what I want to do in my life. Um, even when, before I got into RTI, way back before then, when I was working for Taiwan News, I did recording for them. And that was my first time doing recording. That means going to the studio, and uh, it's, it's, they have this weekly magazine, but then you know how then you, they will always make these uh, uh, you know, sound, you know, they come with CDs. So I would record for the CD. I would just read the content, very simple. Just read the content, you know, read the vocabularies, and that's all I do, do recording. And it was my first time, I was nervous. But after a while, hey, it wasn't that bad. And I even learned, I mean, if I would listen back to the very first time I record, and then 10 years later, I recorded 10 years for them. Um, later, I'm sure there's a big difference because then I learned to have more confidence in my voice. And you can tell if you have confidence in your voice. So I learned how to, well, I'm still learning, how to really use a diaphragm to talk, you know? And uh, it, it's, it's, it's different so that you don't hurt your voice. You don't go from here, but you try to, so that means when you breathe, uh, breathe out, it should, it should come out instead of in. So that's the proper way to breathe when you do broadcast so that you don't get tired and hurt your throat. But anyway, so I learned all that, right? And uh, I remember um, that somehow I learned how to do that because I remember when I was on the street, just walking on the street, and my kids were younger. And then I would turn around and yell my kid's name, Zhang Xia. And then everybody on the street would turn around and look at me. And I'm saying that I'm a very thin person. I, have a very, I used to have a very small, soft voice, but now it's like I had no idea. I was like projecting my voice, but uh, I'm thankful for my job to make me confident in my voice, I guess. And then, um, then eventually, it wasn't just reading. Eventually, the boss wants me to read and explain the English. And I was going, I'm not an English teacher. I was never an English teacher. I can't explain. So I started getting nervous again, you know? And I realized that if it's something that I've never tried before, that it's new, I have no confidence. I want to make sure that I'm 100% confident that I, I know I'm going to do this right before I go on stage, that kind of thing. So I was nervous. So what did I do? I didn't know what to do. Um, I called somebody who's a foreigner in Taiwan He's kind of experienced in this. So he says, oh, it's easy, and explain to me that you just do this and that, and it's, you know, it's no big deal. So, all right, fine. First time I tried, second time I tried. After a while, hey, it wasn't that hard anymore. So I went from a simply just reading and recording to eventually read, record, and explain, okay? And um, that, I overcame that obstacle. Then, um, actually it was John who saw the ad in the papers uh, for RTI. He said, hey, go try it. I said, what, me? You know? But um, gosh, the translation test was not easy. You had to be up on the current news, and you know, my chance is not good. So, but hey, I, I actually did it, I remember it was then when there was a um, referendum, and I, I was glad, like, oh, there's the two words, and I was going like, oh, what's that word, what's that word? Oh yeah, referendum. I was like, oh, great. Because <laughs> I thought that, oh my goodness, it's a good thing that I, you know, I was up on the news, and I, I found that. 
But um, you know, when it comes to translation, and I think I also enjoy uh, simultaneous interpretation, which is you know like actually it's a delay of three seconds that you kind of um, I, I used to I tried before when you're off in a booth at a conference and you're supposed to translate right away, right? And I think I like that more than um, consecutive translation because you have to listen to someone say a whole five lines, but then I'll be like, what did you say? Because <laughs> I forget what he said in the beginning. But, um, so I prefer simultaneous interpretation, which is 逐, 欸, 逐步, no, 逐字翻, okay, 逐字翻. Um, anyway, why did I get to this point? Okay. So, I, I, got, I took the test and I got into RTI. Well, actually, the first time when I took the written test, you know, I didn't get in. So it wasn't until, you know, like eight years later before I finally got in. But now I'm in radio. And I never thought, I never, never thought I was going to go into radio. Like Professor Chen was saying, like, economics and math major, how did you go from here to broadcasting? I don't know. I feel, I feel lucky. And uh, I've really enjoyed broadcasting ever since then. You know, I think my problem of this, and, and, and you know, broadcasting with no, not, not in front of camera, to now in front of a camera, um, you know, people would tell me, because I'm always still very hard on myself. Every interview, after the interview, I evaluate myself. You know, I say, oh, that could have been done better. Oh, that wasn't, that could be better, and that could be better. So, which is good, but that's how hard I'm, I am on myself. And, um, you know, my dad, I don't think he really thinks highly of this job. You know, he, um, my brother, I have a younger brother, um, he, uh, after he graduated from undergraduate, he got a job almost on Wall Street in New York. It's the one after, parallel to it. So. You know, he almost got to Wall Street. You can say that. Because why? Because I think my dad made me feel, okay, and I don't think that's bad, but I'm sure that some of your parents are like that. Maybe it's your mom or your dad, that they make a mistake of comparing among the siblings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I see someone shaking her head. You know, and he made me feel that. And I told him to his face, I said, you're, you, are you comparing me and my brother? Because he got a job almost on Wall Street, but I didn't. And he said, oh, no, 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 you know. But honestly, I was really hurt, you know. Um, and, and, and I don't know, some parents, they like to say about great things about the neighbor's kids. You know, you know, so-and-so went to Taita. You know, so-and-so's kids went to Beinu. You know, so-and-so's kids went to Harvard. And so-and-so kid went to Princeton. and and. You know, that's not healthy for the kids. They think that, you know, I'm not only talking about my dad. Some parents think that this is the way to push the kid to do what they think is right for the kid, you know, for the child. But I don't think so. Some people, that works, you know, if they make you push you, you know, go to Harvard, go to Harvard, go to Harvard, it'll, it'll get you a good future. And then, the kid said, okay, yeah, I agree with you, and then go. But then there are others. That's not the way. I think I'll rather, as I went in life, that I discovered that I'll rather that my dad let me make mistakes, and I'll learn from my mistakes. And don't be afraid of mistakes. Don't be afraid of failures. And that's what I have to constantly remind myself. Because even now, I don't think I'm great in front of TV, actually. Um, people would say, including my husband, you're good, you're great. And I'm going like, I'm just, to be honest, I said, I'm just being myself. But that is because um, some people actually ask me, how come you can be so natural in front of the TV? And I said, well, in a way, I don't feel, just pretend the TV's not there. It's like you're just talking to a good friend. And that's what I do, is that, of course, the very first beginning, you know, um, our studio is not a big professional one. And I was told that when you interview the interviewee, and besides, the first time it was like sitting, not facing the interviewee, it was more like to the camera, you know, and so I had to turn.
But the thing is that I was asked that every now and then I still have to go and look back at the camera. And so I'll be like talking and look back at the camera. But it's so unnatural, you know. So I'd rather just talk to my interviewee, right? Like a good friend. But so I said I'm just being myself, which I think it's already a big step for me to feel that I, you know, I'm not doing it under pressure or something like that. So I think that um, I wish that parents like that, who are harder than kids, would learn to let go and just let their children find their way. You know, um, my dad is the kind of person who would even like. I know he'll probably say something about this: uh, dye my hair <laughs> or putting on nail polish. I don't know how picky your parents are, but my dad is like that. Um, some some of you maybe it's a mom or something like that. But uh, you know, so I, I I'm very uptight around my dad. Although I've come a long way, I'm finally learning to realize that that's the way he is. Because you know, to be honest, all of our parents must have had a model, and it was their parents that made them the way they are today. And then today, he's made me the way I am today. And it's funny. You know, I don't like the things that he controls me, but I realize that I actually control my kids and my husband, you know. And it's, it's something you can't, you can't change overnight. You can only work on it. And work on it, eventually you will. And I think that, I think most of us want our parents to know that, hey, we've already grown up. We're an adult. You know, we can make our own decisions. And it's okay if we make our own mistakes. Because I feel that my dad is trying to kind of like hold me up in his arms, in his hand, and bring me up so that I don't have any mistakes or faults or failures. I don't drop in the holes. He's like trying to move me over so that, so that I don't fall into traps. I don't, you know, uh, make wrong mistakes. But you realize that that's not what you want. What you want is that I want to fall in. I want to fall and then pick myself back up again. Because then I'll learn more that way. Instead of you force feeding, telling me you should do this and not do that. You know, so I really have come a long way. That's why I, I, I see myself as from pupa to a butterfly. Um, I'm still working, you know. I still, I still, you know, always hard on myself thinking of the mistakes and things like that. And, but I, I have to constantly tell myself, well, what's done is done. Like for today, you know, I think that maybe afterwards, you know, at 12, we're gonna, I'm gonna sit down. I'm gonna say, oh, I forgot to say that. Oh, I forgot to share that. I'm gonna have to let it go. I'm just gonna have to let it go. Because honestly, if you have all the time in the world today for me, I'll be t I can go on and on about my life. Every one of your life is colorful. And it can be very colorful, depending on how you want to make it. Not what somebody draws it out for you, but you're the one that's going to draw your own life. So I think be bold enough. And I'm, I'm finally, at my age, and like I said, I'm not young, finally at my age, I, I'm just telling myself, I'm going to let go of my dad's claws and try and just go ahead and do what I want to do instead of falling short because he would always say like no don't try that and i'll be like oh all right and don't try that and i'll be going like okay well then what can i try but i'd say what is on your heart that you want to try i say you just go for it it's better off don't be afraid of mistakes don't be afraid of failures because those are the valuable things over success and i honestly believe that and I think there are a lot of people, I think Taiwan is changing. Because I think Taiwanese people are, are like Stanley. They're starting to be aware about letting kids do what they want to do, even though it's a crazy idea. And I think there are more and more young people who are trying crazy things. But they're, they're willing to try. They want to go for it and just try it until something tells them to stop. And I think parents have to learn to let go and give that freedom because I think 
That's what we have these days. People are more free thinking and more daring and willing to take risks. So I think that's what, what makes you, you know, a contributing person to society and also that's what makes you a unique person in your own way. Well, I can go on and on talking about my life, honestly, but um, we have like about 10 minutes or even less, or actually less, maybe like five minutes. I don't know if you guys have any questions or that you want to know about me. <coughs> Anything. Yes. I would like to mention something about uh, the Ministry of Education, Stanley Bright. Uh, the Ministry of Education. Yes. That you show. Uh, right, Stanley Yen. Yeah, what he yes. said about it. I yeah. think I think it's very interesting the the analysis he 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 did. Like, don't put water into a bucket, but rather to light up a fire. Yeah. So I think it's very interesting because in some uh, Taiwanese universities, there mm -hmm. will be this trend of um, putting students into competition. Like, for example, if there are some grades, they will be sent by email, revealing the names. Oh, So yes. I think it's, it's very surprising. I think it's very positive that there is people like him in Taiwan and um, it would be positive if it also gets into some universities that they still have these kind of uh, techniques of competition because I felt what you said about your father yeah. it kind of applies as well in these kind of techniques so it seems like that's the conventional way of things that, that uh, how things are done in Taiwan um, I think Taiwan is learning you know it's changing it's learning but very gradually, you know, a, a lot of the trends, other countries catch on before it finally gets to Taiwan. So, I, do you intend for me to say something to, to the education ministry? Is there urgency? <laughs> I don't have that right. Well, I think he has the, he has has some a very points. positive mindset, but some professors probably still have, a, they still need to gradually change and also, for example, openly say, or compare students. I think that's a very, from my point of view, it's very negative and it's also even frustrating. Mm. Because I think every person should uh, kind of challenge him or herself rather than compete because everyone has a different background. So I don't think it's positive. And even I think it's, as you mentioned before, it can be even in somehow frustrating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, like Stanley said, he said he's only one person. He wished that there would be more people that can do the same, you know, have the same goal, have the same dream and direction and work together. It really takes more. But of course, it has to start with one person and he's doing a great job. He said, um, he, uh, I forgot if that was the, the, the video I put, but um, he actually was invited to the government and spoke three times. But then at the end of it, he said, I'm an idiot because they weren't listening. They were just there and kind of look at their watch and trying to say, I'm oh, sorry, I've got the next meeting to go to. <laughs> I've written a letter to um, when Ma ying was Taipei city mayor. I wrote an email to him because um, back then, when my kids were younger, um, this has to do with English. <laughs> I, 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 I have, you know, I have, um, uh, I'm critical about the way English is taught in Taiwan. My daughter was in, um, in, in um, kindergarten. She came back one day and said, Mom, Mom, I learned a song today. And she started singing. She said something, something, ramble, something, something, ramble. I'm going like, Cynthia, what's the ramble? Tai Hong I said, oh, it's rainbow. He said, no, teacher says ramble. And I'm going like, oh, I wanted to cry. Okay, then another time, uh, it was at work, and I called to um, give my name. And so I spelled my name, I said S-H-I-R-L-E-Y. And the other person goes, huh? And I'm going, S-H-I-R-L-E-Y. Oh! And I was like, oh, I wanted to cry again. You know, nothing <laughs> critical of you guys, okay? But, um, so I wrote about this in the letter, because I think, but the thing is that he never wrote back to me. Um, it was through a good friend. So my friend told me that, Oh, he said that he got your email. He did get the letter. You know, I said, oh, okay. But, because I think afterwards I realized that he, there's nothing much that he can do. 
you want to try to change everybody's mentality in the government alone, it's, it's going to, I don't know what it's going to take. It's not easy. So I think he's aware of the problem, but he doesn't know what to do about it. But anyway, Stanley decides that he's just going to, no matter what everybody else is doing, he says that he's just going to start it by one person, and as long as he lives, he's going to work on it. I think he's got a great heart. And I told him, I said, gosh, if, if there's anything I can help, because I'm in media, as if I can really help, <laughs> but, uh, you know. But, um, but after, while preparing for this, and watching his video again, I said, I really, really want to get in touch with him and just let him know how, what I can really do, you know. But, um, but it takes you starting, I don't know, and then getting people on it. It's hard because like, like, you know, with global warming, I wish that everybody knows that you need to love the earth. So switch off the lights, you know, save energy. But if it's only just a small group, but you've got a whole world to educate, it's still going to be hard. I mean, I'm thinking the weather, now winter is like so cold, it's extremes. And in the summer, it's like so hot. I mean, when would it be when we just walk out there with short sleeve and we're going to get sunburned? Just a matter of seconds. I don't know if this is true. I'm not a scientist, but yeah. So, but thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, yes. Would you uh, say that you have your own style of interviewing or it is kind of... Uh, different every time? Good question. I believe um, I have my own style. And um, yeah, just like singers, when they're just new as a singer on stage, I, I think I've watched some of the TV shows where they have these singing talent shows. And a lot of times I've heard the judges say, be yourself. I know you, you do a great job imitating so and so and so and so, but I don't see anything that's you in there, you know? And I think that's really important. Be confident the way you are. I mean, I, okay, I know I have a problem. I have a problem is that I'm not good at, I stutter a lot, um, even on TV. You know, I'm going like, uh, this is Danny Yen from, uh, 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 you know? And I hate that about myself, but I can't change it. Why should I try to change it? So that's me, and I said, I don't care. I'm older than all the other interviewers, and this is the way I am. I'm not going to try and change that, because that's just the way I am. If you like me, you like me. If you don't like me, you don't like me, fine. You know? So, yeah, I think I've discovered my style, and that is from all the encouragement from people around me that made me see that I am good, because I didn't think that I was good, you know? And, um, yeah. Yes? Thank you. One, one thing I want to know more is about when, when you, especially when you say that you, you go back and to be a full-time mom for a long time, and then I just want to know how you can adjust yourself to get into the job again. Because as you say, your idol is like Larry King, uh -huh. and you know most of the time the host of the television show or the radio show they never stop working. So once you stop during at that time and then you came back again, how 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 can you adjust yourself to to be this lively? And, Talkative, talk like really creative. Like this. Okay. Well, thank goodness that for the last seven years I've been at R I RTI. Uh, it's been it's been a continuous seven years, so I have never stopped, and then gone home. But, but you know, being a full time mom was before RTI. So, but um, you're right. You know, uh, at the time when I actually decided to go home and take care of um, my first child, I was, um, uh, I was going like, because it was my husband who said, Wang Wei so you know, this guy, this TV producer guy is looking for a secretary, go interview. And I'm going like, oh, what, what am I going to do with, with our daughter? Who's going to take care of her? Oh, we'll take care of that later. You know, I've, I always said that myself. So I'm a very mother kind of person, I said, First thing I think of is, what about the child? But anyway, of course we got babysitter and everything, because I got the job, so I went back to work, and um, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm, I think my past, and I, this I have to thank my dad, as well as a lot of other things I have to thank my dad, 
It's because of his job that we've lived in Hong Kong, Japan, and the States, well, the States I went by myself. Um, I, you learn to adjust to different cultures. So people ask me if you've gone through culture shock. I think that has given me, given me the experience so that I, don't, that I don't go through culture shock. So likewise, switching from full-time mom back to work was kind of not hard, you know. But I think what I, and I mentioned that, was being a secretary in the States and being a secretary in Taiwan is two very different worlds. And I learned it through the hard way, crying and complaining and everything, but yeah. So um, it, wasn't, it wasn't hard because when you've been home for a while, you know, this is just the, the agony that mothers, full-time mothers go through. Because when you're home, you want to be with kids, but after a while, you kind of miss society. You feel like you're, you've torn away from society. There's a lot that you don't know, you know, and you, you wonder what, what, what to do. And so, oh, can you turn on the light? It's a little dark. Ugh. For the camera, I'm sorry. Um, so, um, it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't hard. Because when you're home, you, you kind of miss the sight, you know, being in, at work. And then when you're at work, now, no, I don't miss being home. Because my kids are all grown up. They're, they're on their own, so. And I think I would enjoy this work. But I can tell, it, tell you the truth is that when you, after you get into broadcasting, you love it for life. Because I've tried um, to go back to being an office lady. Because, to be honest with you, broadcasting, the pay is not, is average. You know? And so when I want, wanted to go back to office lady work, I realized that, again, I feel a gap. And I'm going, do I really want to go back to this? Sit at a desk from nine to five and just typing and just doing research and then go home? Do I really want to do this? I started struggling. So I think, honestly, after you get into broadcasting, you love it for life. You just don't want to leave it because it's more fun than any other jobs that you know. Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, I don't want to take any more of your time, so thank you very much for your patience and um, thank you for your questions and your participation. Yes, oh, one, one last question. <laughs> yeah. Do you have, because like in, in, I learned two languages and you, your language is English and Chinese. Do you have sometimes feeling that you're mixing the languages? Because for me, it's very. Right now, I suppose when I'm writing in English, I still want to sometimes write in Russian because Russian is my native language. Oh wow! We have a Russian service. <laughs> so do you yeah. have these kind of things like when you speak or when you write something? Can do you mixing languages? Yeah. Well, we're in Taiwan. Taiwan is not an English-speaking country, so my English, I think has deteriorated. <laughs> so there are times when I'll be like stuck, I don't know what the English word is, I have to say in Chinese because I don't know. So I, my English is still better than my Chinese though. Um, translating, yes, I think I'm sure, and you know these seven years, it's only finally these one or two years that my translation from, for Chinese, Chinese news stories into English has gotten better. Otherwise, I think it was so much of that Chinglish, English kind of translation, word by word, and you know, when you don't, when I go back and read, I'm calling, what did I just write? It's hard. But, you know, I think the rest of us all appreciate it more for being so trilingual or multilingual. It's not easy. And I, I don't think I'm great because there are all these other languages in our radio station, they have to be trilingual. I mean, first of all, they've got their own mother tongue, you know, we're talking about Spanish, huh? right? Then they know Chinese, they have, the Chinese has to be good enough to get to RTI, and then they have to know English. They would, they would know English. So, there you go, just three languages. For me, just two. I don't think I'm great, you know? So I always say that I really respect all those other languages. So, it's okay. Um, I'm sure you get confused, but it's amazing that you can still function properly with all those languages. Yeah, um, I think the point is, the important thing is, well, if I'm talking about translation, 
make sure that you always go back and then and then read it to make sure that it flows because because um, uh, you know I almost always that's why I'm slower than other people because I always have to go back and read again and then change it into proper English because no doubt doing translation it was just very Chinglish English yeah okay well thank you very much thank you and um, uh, if you guys want to get in touch with me I would love for you guys to email me um, or call me <laughs> I always like to make friends that's my my can you read it? can you see it? oh <laughs> yeah I welcome your, your emails and you can always call it's always great to make a friend <laughs> alright thank you yeah. Uh, we will thank uh, Miss Ling uh, today come here to bring us uh, such a wonderful story about herself and uh, about her work. And I think it's also very empowering and encouraging that uh, she's not from journalism or mass communications, but uh, still um, she can uh, she can she can learn from her work. And uh, the some one thing that is very charming or uh, fantastic about this job uh, working in the media is that you can always learn uh, from your your work and. Uh, during the process, you explore your own potential, and uh, let's thank her again. Thank you. Thank you. And you can always contact her if you have any questions. Call her or email her. <laughs>